hello, and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rat Bastard. And the, the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the internets is Joe Crazy Writer. How are you doing today, Joe? Oh, man. I think I'm addicted to brake fluid. But I can stop any time. Are, are, are you going to be the one drinking on this podcast? I might. Okay. It seems like everybody's getting drunk in order to do it but me. Yep. yep. When you get a bladder infection, you're in trouble. Oh, that's no good. So is it drinking the brake fluid that caused the bladder infection, or is that the cure? I'm not sure. Just stay away from the antifreeze. I hear that's bad for you. Just take away your 90. Please clap. Isn't it great that Jeb Bush was able to find a job after I, de- de- getting out of there? You pay him more than me. I'm a, I am so out of here. Wait, I pay you? That's what I'm saying. If you pay him more than me. But he looks so sad. He does. He reminds me of how Moses makes his tea. He brews it. Please clap. Oh, and there we go again. <laughs> I, I, I just hang on, one, one more. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta make a little smiling joke. Okay, why were the Indians here first? They had reservations. Please clap. <laughs> you know, if you keep this up, I will tell one. I, well, you know, I can't have all the fun. We gotta keep Jeb working. So, how are you doing this week? You didn't answer the question. Oh, we'll get to it when we get the freaking. Oh, that's the, that's not good. That's twice in a row. I the, know. The, the, it's just foreshadowing. It makes people want to fast forward to the end of the uh, podcast there. We don't want them to do that. We want them to listen to the entire thing. The, 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 the rich goodness that flows from our brains. Yeah. All that <laughs> fog, sometimes I missed. Okay, J- Jeb's done now. You, you, I've sent him home. <laughs> That's like saying I didn't like my beard at first, but then it grew on me. Uh, I wonder if I know sell this enough that that people will. I, I, I can't wait. I I, I got to keep Jeb working, keep Jeb alive. Uh, we got a letter. We did a yes. real letter or one of them fancy digital email type letters. A fancy digital thing about Bob, which is good for me. Oh yeah, Luke Rathbun. Oh, that gave sounds feedback like a on the show. Line. That sounds like a fake name if I've ever heard one. He he, he sent us a letter. I, I'm not going to read the freaking because the freaking is something that we handle internally. Oh, but, what the heck? Oh no! I have been listening to the show for the past two ye- for at least two years, Thank you. and have really grown to enjoy listening to your conversations. Whether it's a Tales from the Shop, or home comic reviews, recent comic news, or even wrestling news, which I don't really care about, but I still enjoy, it has been fun to listen to all, listen in on good friends talking. Wait, wait, well, uh, Joe, are we good friends? We're not unfriendly. Okay, good. So, thank you for all the hours of entertainment and sharing your lives in this way. Well, thank you for writing. Matter of fact, we, we would like more feedback. We would like more 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 listener wait, 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 li- listener wait. mail. He didn't give his address, did he? No. Because if anybody sends in an email, a letter, or uh, something on that fancy Twitter account or Facebook page and gives us their address, I will take something off my vast accumulation of stuff and send it to them. I've been able to get rid of five things that way. That was a while, a while ago, and believe me, I've got more coming. <laughs> Please help me. But uh, you never send me anything. That's because I don't have your address. I, I Believe it or not, I actually have something for you. It, it surfaces every so often, and then uh, it disappears again. Much like the Bermuda Triangle. It's more of a uh, hexagon, really. Oh, okay. I learned that watching Cheers last night. Yeah, which of the which of the tons of new channels is Cheers on now? I'm watching it on Netflix. Oh, okay. 
Because one of the things that I did get to do this weekend for a little bit, I did get to flip around on the, what, Antenna TV and Me TV and Heroes and, and, and Comet. And there are all these channels that show nothing but old reruns. Mm-hmm. And I've talked about this before in the past, but I was watching an episode of Columbo. And Columbo, really good show, very well written, really enjoyed it. The problem is, it looked like it was filmed in a high school gym. Well, they might have been doing it back then that way, you know. And on a nice TV with really good sound. Oh my God, it sounds terrible. (laughs) That is one thing our good friend Nick uh, used to say. He could not watch old TV shows because he upgraded to like a super high definition television and he got the blu-ray before it wasn't even given a color yet so he had everything up to date he could not run old dvds so it just made his eyes hurt he was so hey, used Jim. to the high definition that it just uh it just wasn't any fun anymore that's one of the things that i've noticed in watching some of the older dvds especially shows from the 70s and 80s they look terrible um all in the family Great show. Can't watch it. It, it. it just looks like it was filmed uh, for 35 cents on somebody's uh, web, on somebody's uh, old camcorder. Are we recording already? Yes, yes. we are. Oh, okay. Corey I was got waiting here. for you to call me. I know. I was trying to tell him, Corey, give Jen a call. No, no, she'll jump in when she's ready. I, I didn't see you come online. I've been online. I've been waiting for like five minutes. You owe her five minutes, Strode. Oh, she gets more than five minutes. Oh, good. And joining us late in in the show, like, I don't know, five minutes no late. No thanks to you. Yeah. No thanks to me. Five minutes. Because I'm a seconds. terrible producer. How much are you two paying me for this? Way too much. Exactly. You buy me dinner all the time. So I'm paying. He doesn't yeah. buy me squat. That's because you're not well, pretty. It, well... Jen's been sitting over there making art, taking her pretty pills. Joe just keeps getting, you know, more and more hey, angry. I well, you can't my, get more bald. I shave my bikini zone. Am I doing it for nothing? <laughs> Jen Wicked joining us. How you doing today, Jen? I'm okay. I'm not drunk tonight. Well, then the, the show may be coherent. I know, right? And you've got so you're you're stepping out on your own. Trying the new media thing. Oh, yeah. Well, can we save that for later? We can. Okay. We got a book to read. Yes, we do. We did. And it's a book that everybody would be interested in who is on this show. Yes. <whistles> Joe, that's IDW. Awful. IDW sent us the first volume of X-Files Season 11, what what IDW started doing about, I don't know, two years ago. They said they were working with X-Files creator Chris Carter on doing further seasons of the X-Files, much like um, Dark Horse does with Buffy, like a um, couple of companies tried to do with Jericho, with, um, I think, uh, Zenoscope does Charmed, which I don't care about Zenoscope, and I don't care about Charm, so I know very little about it. But The X-Files, I read Season 10, and now Season 11 is coming out in book form. And they sent us a copy. The, the Volume 1 contains the first five issues. So, Joe, what did you think? Why didn't you tell me to read Season 10 first? You didn't ask? Well, they didn't think, send us that? Yeah. Well, I would advise that. go out and read season 10, because as I was reading through this, I kept asking myself, okay, well, why are the lone gunmen back? Uh, where was Gibson? Uh, where, where are all these people going? Fortunately, thanks to Wikipedia, I was able to at least jump online and kind of realize, oh, in season 10, even though... This has nothing to do with the TV show. Yeah, I was about to ask that because I saw what you mentioned, like they were working with the show, but then they weren't. And I saw like two or three different versions of the story on Facebook. So this isn't considered show canon, right? No, this is not canon. 
And one of the things that was weird when IDW announced it, they said, Chris Carter is helping us plot. Right, that's what I... Then when they're doing the lead-up to the new X-Files series, Chris Carter said, yeah, they're doing a comic book. Um, it, it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. I don't know what they're doing over there. So you kind of wonder if IDW kind of eh, maybe uh, uh, spread a little on manure is a nice way to put it. Or maybe Carter got a better deal because we all know plenty of guys who started out in comics, got a big fat check from some TV guy saying, we're going to produce your movie that never came to pass. But they got enough money where they never had to do a comic book again in their life, didn't, and just disappeared into a video game haze. Yeah, there's, that's true. So it could be that would happen, you know, because I think X-Files started long before there was even rumors that they were going to do an X-Files series. Oh, yeah. So The X-Files series came together very quickly from what I heard. Take it as, like Corey said, it's non-canon. So, and, you know, some of the ideas were actually pretty good. I mean, if, if X-Files actually does go beyond the six-show six premise on Fox, when it sounds like it might, you could bring the lone gunman back. Yeah, we just faked our death. You know, no big deal. Not like that hasn't happened before. Yeah, it all was a dream sequence, and it disappeared when I took a shower. Anyway, so once I got past that, <clears throat> the second panel brought me to a screeching halt. And I will quote, because they're in Zion Park National Park, Utah. Uh, slow down on the aneurysm, Taylor. At this altitude, you'll need all the oxygen your brain can handle. And my brain stopped and said, okay, obviously the person who wrote this has no idea what Zion National Park is. Zion is a canyon. I've been all over Zion. There is no place in Zion you have to worry about high altitude because <laughs> you're going down. You're not going up like you would on a mountain. Not to mention Zion Canyon has the world's, if not, well, definitely United States, if not the world's air, possible. If you go there, you actually catch cold because your body coughs up all the crap you've been breathing in city life and farm life. And then, of course, as soon as you leave the park, you catch cold again as your body reacclimates itself. Did you so, really think they thought when they sent us this comic to review that it was going to get raked over the coals by a Parks and Rec nerd? Well, <laughs> it just goes to show how poorly they plan out this crap. I mean, they sent Chris Claremont to Paris for a single issue of X-Men. You think they could have at least gotten it right? Uh, that's okay. I didn't like the movie Twister either, because there's no way you're going to drive that close to an F5 tornado and live. But I digress. That movie was stupid for all kinds of reasons, much less that. Well, the flying cow was kind of cool. Kind of a precursor to bat cow. The flying, cloud, the flying cow does not hold up, by the way, Joe. No, it doesn't. It, it really looks like somebody. It looks like somebody drew a cartoon cow. Uh, <laughs> wow, it's a sequel to Roger Rabbit. I will say I did like the art. The number one problem you have with licensed characters, and of course we raked Miami Vice over the coals on this, is you at least got to make the characters recognizable. If I'm scrambling trying to figure who's who, you've, you're going to lose me really quick. And even when Mulder finally showed up, I was kind of like, is that Mulder? He doesn't have a mustache. And, of course, that ties into a joke later on in the book. Uh, the, the characters are written a lot like they act in the TV show. And this is a question I don't recall if I asked when we were de dealing with Miami Vice. Corey, when you read that, and you read it more than I did, did the characters at least act like they did on the TV show? Not really. Okay, so again, that's that's a losing thing. In this case, they do act like they did in the show. I found myself... I'm trying to think of what the right word would be. I was just propelled to keep reading it. I would get to the end of an issue, and I was like, oh, good, I got more to read, and I got more to read. And unfortunately, the book ends... I guess it's the end of the season, isn't it? Or is there another... No, okay. there will be one more volume of this. Okay, good, because if that was the end of the season, I'd be most upset. Let me cross that script crap off my... If you were a big X-File fan, you understand the conspiracies, you understand... Again, I had to go look up who Gibson was. You're going to love this book. 
because it's it's right up the alley. Don't get your head nodded in the you know. Well, what about the TV show versus the book? Like we said before, it's non-canon. Enjoy it for what it is. I mean, we enjoy plenty of Star Trek and now a whole vast universe of Star Wars that way. Again, this is just for the comic guys. If you have a X Files friend, family, co coworker, whatever, this would be a book you'd want to hand them to see if they're interested in. Of course, I will, on a downer note, mention I have handed X File comics to my wife before, and she's pretty much, eh, whatever. She's just not a comic reader. Jen, what do you, your opinion of the book? I really, really wanted to like this. I I love X Files. You know, I started watching it around the third season of the TV show or the second. I can't remember, but you know, I mean, I went back and watched it all from the beginning and and watched. You know, back then we didn't have the DVRs and time shifting and everything, so you had to run home to catch it. You know, when it was on, or you'd have to try to figure out to get it in reruns. So I've been a huge X Files fan for a long time. And this is my first exposure to the comic. And I have to say, um, I I didn't read issue 10. I didn't know there was issue 10. I just read what you sent me. But I can follow it well enough. You know, I I, I don't remember all the characters or some of this, but you know, you it's 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 well written enough that I could figure out what was going on from context. Um, unlike Joe, I'm going to say probably my main complaint actually is the art. It's really good in some places, um, but I'm just really not, uh, the shadows are so heavy that in some places it's really difficult to tell what's going on in the pictures. I get they're trying to capture the aesthetic of, of the TV show where, where everything was lowly lit, but these shadows are kind of just chunked in just solid and, and it's, it, it's kind of hard to follow kind of hard to recognize and distinguish faces from one another so i'd like to see like maybe the the line work be a little tighter and and the shadows a little less heavy but i mean that that's a minor complaint overall i just had a hard time reading it in a few places i'd like to echo what jen said my one complaint about the book was the the art now, the first thing I have to say, we all read this on a, on a screen, and it was laid out beautifully to read on a computer screen or a tablet. A lot of vertical panels uh, so that when you scrolled down, you didn't have to scroll up, scroll down, scroll up, scroll down. But the facial work was, I, I thought the facial work was off. There were some where the faces looked right, and there were some where... I, I couldn't tell if it was the inking was too thick or if the artist was just not using enough um, photo reference. But people's faces seemed to change panel to panel in a way that was distracting. Um, and as Jen said, I thought way, way, way too much of the shadowy aesthetic. Now, I've read a lot of X-Files comics. The ones in the 90s were actually drawn by Charles Adlard, who's now drawing Walking Dead. And he had a more kind of surrealistic, almost a Bill Sienkiewicz way of drawing the book. This seemed to be going more for a more realistic art style, but I it just did The artist needs more practice. They just need to learn more about how to, when to pull back, and to create the atmosphere. Story-wise, however, I like this a lot more than I've liked the X-Files TV revival. Because the X-Files TV revival just kind of, oh yeah, Mulder's wanted by the FBI. Eh, who cares? We're, we're getting rid of that. Um, a lot of the stuff from, from the past, eh, it, it was almost like the, the TV series was kind of saying, yeah, 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 whatever. We're, we're moving on, which I understand. But this kept all that stuff from the TV series, and the main bulk of the story was, one, was kind of a sequel to one of my favorite episodes. And it had that feel of there's something bigger going on here. Um, they're, 
the thing that I always liked about the X-Files was while Mulder and Scully were part of the FBI, it almost felt like the FBI was kind of one of the antagonists. And I don't get that on the new version of the TV show, but I really got it here. Joe Harris did a great job of bringing you into the story, giving the bulk of a story, and then pulling back to say, oh, and the the antagonist who's been kind of behind this, now we're going to tell you about him and why he's doing what he does. Well, the story's good. I, I, I have a hard time, you know, following a lot of comics. And this is well written enough that I can I can follow it easily and tell what's going on without it, you know, I guess being too labored, but but it's just yeah. it's just the muddy art that, that I have a yeah. problem with. Do you think this suffers from the talking head syndrome? And if you're if you're not familiar with that, I remember talking with Dan Jurgens and he was explaining why Star Trek doesn't work necessarily in comics, because Ninety percent of Star Trek is them sitting around discussing the problem. Works fine on television where you have actors and they can emote and they can act, but in comic books it doesn't work so well to have everybody sit around with page after page of just okay, here we gotta explain what's going on. There were a few parts in this where I thought it started to bog down in that, where they're trying to explain what's going on. And I kept thinking, you know, if we were watching either the T V show or maybe uh, a less heavy ink, they'd be able to tell what's going on by the facial expression. It only happened a few times, and I think I just kind of put that in the back of my head and said, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy this because I was really starting to get into the narrative more than this talking head thing. But do you think that happened too much, and is that a problem when you're trying to adapt something like X-Files? I think it could be. I'm kind of scrolling through looking at it again, and, and it looks like they've made an effort to at least have the characters, like, moving around doing things while they're talking. There's, like, a car chase here, and they're going through some fields. They're not just, just standing around talking, but but I can see where you might you might get that out of it. I think there were some sequences, but I I disagree with Jurgens on that because I think Star Trek has done well. Some of the best EC comics are people talking or people sitting. Um, one of the classic EC comics is a guy in a key shop who, you know, he came in to make a key to break into, you know, a bank or something. And the entire story takes place in the key shop as he keeps knocking over the keys. It's the artist's job to to vary things, to move the camera, to, to you know, pull back, pull in, and do pacing. And a really good artist can do that. I think the artist did a good job with the pacing in this. Never once did I feel like I was reading through exposition. But again, when you pick up a comic like Star Trek or The X-Files or whatever, you know you're not going to get a, a five-minute I'm sorry, a five-page fight sequence or, or something like that. So it depends on the artist and the writer working together to make it interesting. And again, I will throw out Wally Wood's 22 panels that always work. Wally Wood created a poster for the people who worked for him for, you know what, when, when a writer gives you a, gives you a script that has a lot of talking, here are the panels to use to make that interesting. A good artist knows how to borrow from that, and I think the artist on this, like I said, the layouts were great. Never once did I feel bogged down. But I could see what you're talking about, Joe. And I think there have been some comics, I know Bendis gets accused of it a lot, where, oh, this issue, the Avengers are all just sitting around talking. If an artist is smart, they know how to make that interesting. It's like when you go to a I, – I did acting in high school and college and some afterward. One of the things they talk about is business. You need to be doing stuff because you're going to be giving a lot of dialogue. So it's okay. You need to walk from here to here. You need to have something in your hand. You need to do something so it's visually interesting. And a good artist knows that and can be kind of like a set designer and a set director. Um and again, I'm going to praise Jin on something. I would say at least two-thirds of the strips that she has drawn is people just standing around talking. 
but she knows how to make it visually interesting, and she knows how to vary the camera and to put business in each panel. Well, I try to make it visual. No, no, you succeed. <laughs> You're just being nice to me because tomorrow is my birthday. I know. Uh, last week was your birthday. Last week was my and birthday. I, I feel Ooh, bad. I wasn't time travel. Come over and give you a birthday <laughs> spanking like you deserve. Uh, I, I, let you go. I let you down. I'm sorry. This conversation is making me uncomfortable. That's okay. As soon as you get the bottle of vodka I got for you, you'll feel better. Oh, really? So, Joe, buy, borrow, or ignore. If you like X Files, buy it. Buy season 10 first. If you have a friend who likes it, buy it. I will probably personally not. Jim? Uh, I think the same thing Joe said. If you like X-Files, read the other one first, which I didn't know about. Uh, but it's worth checking out. And I am really curious to see uh, this in print because I almost feel like some of the issues with the art may be because my computer screen is scaling it down so that I can read it. And it's just uh, sometimes things don't scale down very well. They look kind of choppy. So I, I'd be interested to see how it looks in print versus trying to read it on a screen, if, 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 if it's a little, uh, little easier to read in that format. And I would put it as a borrow, mostly because it, this is not something I'm ever going to go back and read again. While I liked it, I didn't love it. I liked the story, the art I was iffy on. This is something I would enjoy while I'm reading and then put it in a box and put it away. And I don't do that a lot anymore. It's, I would borrow this from the library. Again, if you're an X-Files fan, you're going to enjoy it. This is not a book that's going to convert you, however, because it's it does rely on the fact that you have watched the X-Files and know the characters and know the situations. So there we go. Cool. Now, talking about whether you would buy it or whatever, Joe wanted to bring up something this week. And, and, and because it's so rare that Joe tries to be producer, I will let Joe introduce our main topic. Ladies and gentlemen, my partner, my heterosexual life partner, the, the, the man I have done this podcast with for six years as of this week, Joe Ryder. So you bought yourself here a comic book. Good for you. What are you going to do with it afterwards? Basically, how do you store your comics? Quick round robin. Jen, how do you store the comics that are thrust upon you? <laughs> you think I have comics? Well, I know Corey sends them <laughs> to you. says, would you please, please read this for the next... Well, they're piled on the bookshelf. And and you have yet to crack any of them open, have you? I... I looked at one. I have, I have a couple of comic books. I mean, they're just, I usually buy like the trade paperbacks or, you know, m most of my, my books are from people I know and, and web comics people aren't doing like single issue comics. They're doing like graphic novels and collections. So they're just, you know, paperback books on the bookshelf, occasionally a hardback book if you, you know, go in for the bonus edition or something. And I have exactly one comic that's, in a plastic bag, and I'm not going to talk about that one, but, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a collector. I like to use my stuff, so you're asking the wrong person. How about you, Strode? What do you do with your comics? When I first started collecting, I would put them in the, the plastic bags that you would get, you know, here's, you know, the, you'd get the bag of a hundred plastic bags, and back then it was like three bucks for a hundred. And I wouldn't board them, but I would bag them and I would put them in comic boxes and stuff. And then I would say by the time I was working at Schinders, we would get these books up from Schinders' basement that had been down there for 10, 15, 20 years that had been put in similar bags. And you'd have to peel the bags apart and it, it would have that horrible <laughs> sound. No crying yes. Let's say the bags apart. And the books inside, you would go, well, this can't be good as this plastic is turning to sludge over the years. And I have too many comics to buy Mylar. So I actually talked to some people in paper preservation, and they said, unless you're going to put the stuff in Mylar, and my expensive stuff I put in Mylar, it's better just to put them in the boxes, 
make sure the boxes are, are you know, out of, not, no water, um, where the temperature is kind of regulated, not too hot, not too cold, avoid, avoid uh, moisture and high humidity. And they'll actually do okay just in boxes. Now, for my hardcovers, I have those on shelves, and I've put pictures up on Facebook of that. Joe's been in in that room. I, I need a lot more shelves. Yes. And paperbacks, I actually, for unless it's something I know I'm going to read a lot, like the showcase show, what is it? The showcases and the essentials. Many of those are in comic boxes as well just for storage, but I don't do a lot with my run-of-the-mill Spider-Man 425 comic. It's in a box there until they became overwhelming. I would keep them in numerical and alphabetical order, but it got to the point where, ah, that's overwhelming, and, and I don't care anymore. Joe, how about you? I've seen your basement. Yeah, when I first started, and I, I might have mentioned this in Solo Joe or somewhere along the line, I had four comic boxes that my dad gave me. I kept runs of comic books in baggies, you know, glad baggies. So this wrapped one was like all my Spider-Man. This was all my uh, X-Men. Every so often I would take them out. I would... Uh, check them out, organize them, put them back in. And I did that for quite some time. Eventually, I started the bag and board thing where I bought the comic boxes, the boxes, the white ones made specifically for comics. I would buy mostly current size bags or new. Occasionally, I'd get a Silver Age one for when I splurged and bought myself a Silver Age book. And then I'd get them all organized, you know, title, number, i put the annuals in back, any, you know, this is long before zero issues, half issues, all that crazy crap come around. Eventually, you know, it grew. I mean, I, I ran into that same problem you did, Corey, where it's like I'd go back and discover, okay, these comics I haven't looked at in 10 years, and the bags seem to be merging together. The comics <laughs> were fine. Now, my... Old partner Pat, he did put everything he had in my lights. My lights are really thin, almost like wrapping paper type bags, but they're acid free. He didn't buy acid free boards, with one exception I'll get to. And then he would put them all together. And since he's blown out 90% of the stuff he'll never read again, and he made it effort about 10 years ago to start bagging and boarding every single comic he got as he got it. So right now his whole collections in my lights, his real expensive books, what are left, he puts in mylars usually. And if they fit, he'll put in a mylite and then inside a mylar, again, he doesn't have acid free boards, but he figures he'll look at his stuff every 10 years and replace them if need be. 99% of my comics are, in some type of board. For a while there, before I owned the comic store, in order to save, I would put issues back to back. So one side would be issue 10, one side would be issue 9. Because I figured these would be in storage, and when I pull them out to read them, that's fine. When I went to sell various runs, it became a pain in the butt, because then I had to rebag and board everything. Now, as I too am starting to weed out the stuff I don't want, I've got my 99% of stuff in bags and boards, and I'm separating them. If I need to, I'll put them in a new board, new bag. The new stuff I get, I just put in a comic box alphabetically, numerically. Eventually, I'll either sell it or I'll get around to bag and boarding it. But especially if I haven't read it, I haven't bagged and boarded it yet. Paperbacks, hardcovers that I got on the shelves. When I used to do more comic shows, there were two, I'm trying to think of the material there, polyethylene and polystyrene. Thank you. One of them was a lot shinier than the other and had a shorter shelf life. 
those would be the ones that I would bag if I was trying to sell it because nothing really makes a comic look bad than having a grungy yellowish board on it. The bags I use are polypropylene, I believe. I don't know which is which because right now I don't. I just have all my bags in a box and sorted by size, you know, new, current, Golden Age magazine. Heck, I even bought some Treasury Edition bags just because I want to get those taken care of. But I think those those have a shelf life, too, of about 10 years. And we laugh every so often when we talk about the bagged issue of the death of Superman because that was in neither. That was probably in the worst type of plastic they could ever have for comic books. So the people that have these things and are storing them away are going to go look at them in a few years. I, I don't know how long it'll take that chemical and that baggie to leach into the Superman comic. They, they might be a bit surprised. So in the future, we'll have, this is a sealed Death of Superman comic. And as you can see, you can feel all the powdery residue in the bottom because the comic has deteriorated so bad. I do notice, though, that when I would have the comic shop, materials were, I think, a bag, 100 bags and boards were like five, six dollars. And then it was like eight dollars, seven, eight dollars for 100 cardboard. Now you almost double those prices ten dollars for a bag and board, ten dollars for a bag, you know, ten to fifteen dollars for boards. I know you can go wholesale if you want, but again, unless you're buying my lights, my Lars, it doesn't really matter. Just bag and board them, look at them every 10 years, or just leave them on a bookshelf. Most of the big collections that were ever found, the Mile High comic collection, the, the church collection, those were never bagged and boarded. They were just bought, put somewhere dry and dark and cool, and then they survived to this day. And they were also in parts of the country that were very dry. Yeah. Um, the Mile High, also known as the Edgar Church, was in um, Denver. Um, many of the others are found places, especially with high altitudes. You're, there's not been a big uh, old comic collection that's come out of, like, Florida or, or you know, where Jin was from, Houston. Places where it's really humid because that destroys paper. It destroys everything. Yes, in including the, the hearts and minds of those who live there. But... Dry is the most important thing. You can keep your paper doing well with by getting rid of humidity, making sure of that. Now, one of the things that I asked Jen to talk about, Jen does original art, and when she sends it out to people, she does a beautiful job of not just packaging it, but also here's how to preserve it, here's how to take care of it. Could you talk a little about that? Because if we have people who are buying original art. And when you're done, I have some original art horror stories for you. Oh, no. See, now I'm going to say something, and somebody's going to accidentally ruin their art, and it's going to be my fault. Oh, no, I will tell people how to ruin their art, but go ahead. I, I really don't do anything that special with it. Most of my artwork I trim to 8.5 by 11 just for convenience sake, and I put it in the... um. I, like I said, polypropylene bags, from what I've read, they're expected to uh, have about a 10-year life, like what he said. Uh, I do keep them in a dark closet uh, unless I get a box out, you know, to, to pull out some artwork. Um, they're, on, they're, they're in there with acid-free boards. Uh, they're, in, they're in boxes that are waterproof, so... There's not so much of an issue with humidity because the box is fairly well sealed. They're kind of a, a waterproof file box, a plastic file box. And some of the art that I've had, I mean, I, I have ones that I bagged and boarded many years ago, and, you know, the plastic hasn't yellowed and, and everything seems good. So they have a, a decent enough shelf life. Um, I'm a professionally trained picture framer that I've been working off and on in that industry for probably – uh, 15 years now, so um, I actually do have a little uh, instructional flyer that I wrote up that I send out with my artwork, so people that are unfamiliar with 
with custom picture framing or framing processes can kind of get a primer on what to expect when they take the artwork somewhere uh, to have it framed and, you know, hopefully like not get taken in or be able to recognize if they go somewhere where the people doing the work don't actually know what they're doing. Because unfortunately, especially with the chain stores, that does happen. You know, frame shops only as good as the framers that work there. So you have to, you have to know something to make sure they know something. So that's why I do it. You know, I, you, you, you die a little inside every time you send a piece of artwork out because you never know what's going to happen to it once it leaves your hands. So I send them all out with a little flyer and hope for the best. One of the things that we have discovered in the last few years is that original comic art may not be as, you know, may not last forever, depending. And I, I said I was going to tell a horror story. Joe, you have you remember Gil Kane's work, right? Yeah. And you know that Gil Kane inked a lot of his own work with markers. Did not know that. What we are finding is that these markers that he used were not as permanent as we thought. Absolutely. That's one reason why I make sure I use pigment-based inks. And it's one reason why I sell uh, my Sharpie pieces so cheap, because those aren't going to last forever. Sharpies in particular, they kind of take a red cast and fade uh, over time. And it doesn't matter what you use to write, you know, what you write on Bristol paper, garbage bags. It doesn't matter. You know, the marker's going to fade. So there is some very classic Gil Kane art in, from key books that has art that has sold for thousands of dollars that is beginning to fade. And they've taken it to all sorts of art experts and all sorts of people who work in it, and they say that all they can really do is slow it down. But there's also a lot of original art that people have been buying for years that they've been, you know, putting up in their house and, and doing like that that it was done, framed kind of cheaply. And as people are selling it, it's, oh, well, you know, this is, pages in this comic are going for between ten and $20,000. This art, which was put in a cheap frame and left in somebody's living room with a lot of uh, open sunlight, has begun to fade, has become to, the, the pages have yellowed. Um, some of the art from the 40s and 50s, especially, the pages have become very brittle because it was stored so poorly. It was really in the late 90s that there started to be a major push for conservation-grade materials and framing. So, I mean, even, even into the 90s, you saw framers routinely using cardboard in the backs of frames. Uh, they still sold regular glass. Most most respectable framing places, including the major chains, only sell UV protective glass. Uh, though I want to caution, um, you mentioned like bright sunlight. Fluorescent lights do an incredible amount of damage to artwork. Do not think just because your original comic page isn't hanging across from a sunny window that you're cool. I, I recommend if anything is valuable, if you care about it at all, make sure you put UV protective glazing over it preferably acrylics. You don't have to worry about it breaking and damaging your artwork at some point. But make sure you use UV protective. And then on top of that, if it's important to you, don't hang it across from a window because even even the UV protective stuff's not 100%. So don't think just because your room, your uh, artwork isn't hanging in a solarium or it's in your basement, you're cool. Because artificial lights still do an incredible amount of damage. Yep. And when you do take... Um, you know, if you're buying, yeah, it is, two of the pieces that I really enjoy, I've bought, are uh, two pages from the comic adaptation of Snakes on a Plane. Do not mock me, I enjoyed that movie, and Joe and I laughed ourselves sick. But one of the things about, especially very modern artwork, is they're not inking on the page itself. They're scanning the page and inking it digitally, so the pages I have are just the pencils. And the pencils fade even faster than inked. So you have to be very careful with this art. And once you're getting to, you know, like Kirby stuff or Ditko stuff or stuff from the 60s, you should probably 
speak to an archivist about how you want to store this art because you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars just for the art itself. For more modern art, it's good to talk to somebody about, okay, I have pencils on on Bristol board or you know, whatever it is so that they can guide you as to how to store it. Now, when it comes to more expensive comics, there is a service that everybody in comics should know about, and that's uh, CGC, Slabbing Your Books, which still is controversial among older collectors. But, Joe, how do you feel about slabbing comics? If you never, and I mean ever, want to touch it again, look at it, smell it, admire the art. Go ahead if and it slab is it. just a collectible. Go ahead and slab it. Yeah. I mean, basically, slab books tend to have a value multiple times an unslabbed one, especially if you can get near the mythical 10 status. Because, you know, it goes from 0 to 10. And I think, what, the only book that was ever graded as 0 was something out of Stanley's personal file copies. And yes, they said with generally. Pages and the cover. Yeah, and they said generally they don't do zero books, but they will. So, yeah, if you're going to, you know, slab your book, never touch it again, it's not a bad idea to do it. It's a good way to maximize your value on old comics if you're going to sell them. Can you explain, uh, hang on, could you explain for the benefit of me, like what exactly slabbing a comic means? There's a service called Comic, what's it called? CGC, Comic Grader. I'll look it up, because I just know it is CGC. Yeah, it's a company, and what they do, they you send them a comic book, and they have professional graders go over the entire comic book. They give it a grading from 1 to 10, 10 being the best, and so on and so on. Okay, it is called Certified Guarantee Company. And there are other companies. There's a PDX one out there somewhere. This has been very common in baseball cards and trading cards and things like that. And a number of years ago, they started doing it in comics. And, of course, the thing that drove everybody crazy is, well, if you had a slabbed comic, and that's kind of the nickname it's became, slab, and you open it up, that voids whatever grading you got on it. So say you had a 9.9, which is a rare comic, you probably get multiples of whatever comic guide says its value. But if you had to open it and read it, you can send it in and they can re-slab it, but you're never guaranteed you'll get that original slabbing for it. But can you tell me what it is? Do they encase it in acrylic? Um, I'm not sure what they do. Well, um, hang on, I have well, a question. Well, talking about this and you can't answer the <laughs> well, one question that I want to know. I, Hold thy tart tongue, my dear. I will go get mine while Corey elaborates, and I will explain to it as I hold it in my grubby little paws. The reason they started was because comic grading was is an art and not a science. There's When I first started reading comics, it was, okay, there's mint, fine, good, and fair. And because people... We go, well, you know, it's better than fair, but it's not as good as good. So they would have, you know, uh, there was very good and then very fine. And then they started doing all this in between. And then Overstreet, which does the comic price guide, mm. in 1991 put out a book on how to grade comics. And they introduced the 10-point scale, 10 being best, 1 being the worst. Anything below 1 was damaged beyond collectability, you know, missing cover, missing pages, stuff like that. Now, one of the weird things was when this great when this book came out, we got it at Schinders, and within two days they ordered us to pull it off the shelves and said that they would not sell that book because the grading system in it was different from the grading that Schinders used, and Schinders was very well known for well our customers are stupid, they won't go anywhere else, so if we don't sell it, they don't know about it. When eBay came into existence, you had many, many more people selling comics. It used to be Mile High sold comics, and Camelot sold comics, and 
and uh, Jim Haney's Universe sold, and individual stores would do their own grading, but the big mail order places, you could kind of say, oh, you know, Mile High, they grade their, they grade their stuff very, very tough. But Camelot down in, in Texas, they're not as tough with their grading. So if you're ordering a mint book, it's probably going to be more a very fine book. Whereas if you get it from Mile High, if it's a mint book, it might even be pristine mint because Rosansky's like that. He's very tough on grading. But when eBay came in and everybody was doing this, there were, came a lot of complaints. You said that this book was in fine. It's not. It's in very good. And there would be disputes all over the place. And this company that did baseball cards came into comics and said, all right, we will provide a service. You send us your book. We will professionally grade it using Overstreet's grading techniques. We will assign it a number value and then slab it. And at the time, they said that this slab would be um, inert plastic. And Joe probably has more information on what the inert plastic is. Well, they don't actually I, will tell you because that's proprietary information. Ah, okay. But I have, then, I have one here. This is uh, my, my infamous copy of Amazing Spider-Man 178, the one that started me down the road to collecting. And the it's about, uh, let me see if I can measure this. It's about, it's like a quarter inch thick. The uh, actual slab runs about 13 inches by 8 inches. Inside comic is inside the uh, encapsulated, sealed, whatever. You know, they say it's inert inside. And then there's hard casing on the outside. On the top of it has the CGC Universal Grade. This one has a 5.0. And then it gives the details of the comics artists, whatever. Uh, mine has the extra comment of white pages. The other thing interesting in, the, in this one is that it has a Green Goblin appearance, and it also has a serial number. Compare that to my Star Wars number two, that only scored a 2.0, which means I read the living snot out of this thing. <laughs> um, I also picked up at a charity auction a Tales to Astonish that has a yellow code which is a CGC signature series. This one was signed by John Romita and Stan Lee on two different uh, dates. It's only a 3.0 because it's got two paces in the center fold, but it's a Tales to Astonish number 77. And then it'll... The other thing about the signature series, if it's got the yellow bar, that comic was signed while an employee of CGC was witnessing it. Yep. They, if it's any, uh, if it's a signature that even if you have that certificate of authenticity, you have a picture of the creator signing the book, it's going to be green because it's actually considered a deficit. Now, the other one you want to watch out for is the dreaded purple, because that means the book had been restored yeah. and uh, there's a sad story and I, I won't get into it because when i do my next solo joe with uh my old partner pat he will tell the tale of the amazing fantasy 15 which was the first appearance of spider-man uh, i forget what the grading was on it but a difference between a restored comic and a non-restored had pat's comic been non-restored it would have been worth about thirty thousand dollars as a restored comic it only ran about four grand. And a lot of people are getting surprised because they'll send in their comic and come back with that dreaded purple. And I think they're still doing purple. I don't know if they decided yes. to stop doing that. There was some, again, you know, everything they're doing, somebody got a complaint about. Somebody had said, oh, well, we don't want purple. It's, it's uh, taking away from the value. And I'm, you're like, well, restored is restored. It's not like some... Yoko sat down and go, yep, this is restored. They run it through several graders, so it's not just one grader's opinion of what something would be. And the other thing about restored books, it doesn't matter if it's an amateur restoration or a professional restoration. And I don't see ads for this anymore. But I know in the 80s and 90s, there were professional comics restoring houses. 
And you could send them a comic with rusty staples and yellowing pages and a chunk out of the cover, and they would be able to clean it up and make it look brand new. They would actually be able to figure out, and I, again, proprietary information, no one who's done it has ever talked about what they did, but they would actually be able to restore the missing piece of the cover or whiten the pages, although um, Greg Theakston has talked a little about what he would do to whiten the pages, and one of the things he said was it was a chemical that was used in publishing, and the reason he knew about it is because he ran his kind of his own publishing house out of his basement during the 70s, but it was a chem chemical mix that was used for some publishers. Now I don't see restoration houses anymore, and I think it's because that the collector ability has moved so far into the slabbing of books that it's just not worth it anymore. Because it used to be you could restore a comic and if it gained five, six, seven hundred dollars in value, it was worth paying these people two hundred and fifty bucks to do the restoration. Now because the price drop is so huge, I don't think it's profitable for people to do anymore. No. Now, the last thing I'll mention, you, you'd mentioned, do, would I slab a book? I, I tried to go down that route a few times. I sent in books that I thought were absolutely flawless, and I come back and I got like an 8.0 and whatever. I sold the books for basically what I paid to get them slabbed. It wasn't even worth doing it. The comic creator, Bo Smith, who has a series coming up called Winona Earp, which should be very cool if you get a chance to catch it. I forget what it's on. FX. It'll be on Sci-Fi, sci and it's based on a comic he did. It's a comic he's done off and on since the 90s. Yeah, and it's going to be a comic again, I believe, is it Boom or IDW or somebody? somebody IDW. Somebody's doing, doing it. it. So, Anyways, he suggested he only slabs comics that have a personal meaning to them because he's old school like us. If he has a comic, he more than likely is going to pull it out and read again. Hence the two copies I talked about, The Amazing Spider-Man 178 with the 5.0, my first comic book that started me on the road to collecting, and the Star Wars number four, I bought that at a comic newsstand up in uh, Ely, Minnesota, where my grandfather used to have a cabin. So when I look at that comic, it provokes more memories to me than just buying the comic. So I would say, if, if unless you're... Uh, you know, never, ever going to read it again, or you're looking to protect it and maybe sell it, just slab a comic that means something to you. And the last thing I will talk about with slabbing, I said that there was controversy around it. When slabbing started, a lot of the timely Atlas collectors, a lot of the people who collect the older, older stuff that Marvel published before they were Marvel, a lot of the Atlas books were so rare that the only copies available were slabbed. And a lot of these collectors of this stuff are more, they wanted to go through, they want to index who was the artist, you know, who wrote it, who drew it, who inked it, who worked on this book. And they didn't have credits back then, so they would have to examine, okay, I know this artist does this style of cross-hatching. I know this artist would use a French curve for this thing. I will match up my French curve that I got from the same shop that he did. These, these people are geniuses in this very, very limited area. And it's one of the reasons why I have so much crap in my brain about comics. When you read what these guys wrote, you go to your, you know, Joe says, oh, Corey knows a lot about comics. If I read something by uh, Doc V, I'm an idiot. This, this guy knows everything about Marvel from 1959 back. But he would take great joy and actually post pictures of him buying this stuff off eBay and cracking the, <laughs> cracking the slab to get at the book inside. Myself, I only have a few books slabbed, and it's books that I bought as investments. My Weird Fantasy number 12 I have slabbed. My uh, Tales from the Crypt 35 I have slabbed. My... Um, Incredible Hulk 181 I have slabbed. What grade do you got on it? Um, the Weird Fantasy is a 6. The Tales from the Crypt is a 7. 
and the Hulk is a five. So while they're not great, they're still worth more than, you know, just putting it up on eBay so what, if I ever... What perked me up is that was the last slab comic I bought as an investment was a Hulk 181, and I had it at a nine, and I think I paid 500 for it, and I hung on to it, and then a couple of years later I had an emergency and I ended up selling it for seven, but I, I wanted to hang on to it for long term, and now, of course, it's in the stratosphere. I do want to mention CGC also does uh, movie lobby cards, which I thought was interesting. They do photograph certification, including vintage, original, and contemporary. And they also do magazines. So if you've got that first Playboy with Marilyn Monroe, that might be worth They do the same thing, 1 through 10. And, uh, and of course, I think they really went crazy with comics. Yeah. You know who else goes crazy, Joe? Uh, let me guess. Um, uh... These guys are sponsors? That's right! Believe it or not, kids, this silliness has actual real sponsors. Our first sponsor is Graze.com. Graze gives you healthy snacks sent to your house. You can have them delivered weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, and your first box is free if you use the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-B. Our second sponsor is Bombas. Bombas socks are some of the best socks in the world. And remember, for every pair you buy, they donate a pair to a homeless shelter or other worthy cause. Just go to bombas.gotocloud.org slash SF30. That's right. Those are our ads. Go check out our sponsors. And after our sponsors, we always ask Joe what's going on on eBay. So, Joe, what's going on on the Ebays? You may rest assured, Corey, you will never, ever... Hear me play Miami Mice number three, the soundtrack, the flexi disc that was in the middle of it. Oh, thank God. Miami Mice? Yes. It was this horrible, horrible, horrible uh, parody book. Back in, the ni- back in the 80s, after the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles got big, everybody thought, oh, well, if I just put out a, a parody comic with animals in it, I'll make millions. You had the geriatric jujitsu gerbils. Is that a joke? No, no these are real books. Preteen dirty jean kangaroos. Um, Marvel was even Marvel even did one that came out like almost ten years after the fad, and they called it Power Pachyderms. But TV series got got the treatment. One of them was Miami Vice by otherwise decent artist Mark Baudet, son of Von Baudet. But I picked it up because it was Mark Baudet, and I really liked his underground stuff. And, oh, my God, the comic is just – it's unreadable. It's, it's, it's got awful shit. And then we did a, a, a April Fool's episode about Joe and I doing a morning radio show playing songs from comics. And one of them was the theme to Miami Vi- Mice, which they had in the third issue, which is one of the most painful things I've ever listened to. And I sold it. Guess how much? A dollar. Bingo. Well, one cent too many. 99 cents. Uh, <laughs> but I, I did. We played it. And uh, I, I probably have an MP3 stored in the back of my computer, the one that's failing. And maybe it'll fail before I actually find it. But before we – I wanted to let you know that. And also, today's Ask the Strode. Okay. Here we go. Corey. How many different titles has Scooby-Doo been in? Oh, jeez. Um, the first one was from Carlton. No. Go back further, because there was a Golden Key. He, he was at Gold Key? Yeah, in 1970. They did 30 issues, and the number one, if you got it, in Near Mint, runs about over 1000 bucks. Huh. Because I remember it at Carlton yeah, when that, I was a kid. Yeah, that was 75 to 76. And I hate it. I hate it. I still, to this day, hate Scooby-Doo. Eleven issues, one digest. And, oh, the Carlton stuff looks terrible. It just looks terrible. Um, Then Marvel, in their short Hanna-Barbera run, did did some Scooby-Doo. Okay. Before we get to Marvel, Harvey did it in 1992. They had... No, no, no. Marvel did it. Marvel did it in the 80s. In the late no. late seventies, early eighties. 
Really? Yeah, because Cause I know they had all the Hanna-Barbera stuff for about a yeah. year. Harvey did it for two... They, well, they didn't really do it. 1992, two issues in what they call Scooby-Doo's Big Book, and then a three issues of... They did three issues of that, and then two giant-sized specials. So that was back when Harvey was trying to come back, and they didn't really do much. Archie had it, 95 to 97... Yep, I remember those. Issues. Yep, those actually did fairly well sales-wise. And then what I found interesting also is Marvel now. They did it 97 to 99. I don't even remember that. Yeah, nine issues. Uh, Two years, nine issues. So they were cranking well, them out. Well, yeah, and what's interesting is <laughs> Carlton, Archie, and Marvel both only did it for two Years. So that must have been the standard license from getting it yeah. from uh, Hanna Barbera. Of interest with Marvel is that Mark Avanier and Don Spiegel did the art. Yep, Dan Spiegel. And all these issues from that we've talked about are big bucks. Even the Marvel one, uh, they all run forty to sixty bucks in near mint because, as you can guess, nobody collected them. And, and now that I know it's uh, Mark Evanier and Dan Spiegel, i got to see them, because every time Mark Evanier and Dan Spiegel put together a comic, it's great. Their run on Blackhawk was the best Blackhawk run ever. Crossfire in the 80s is one of my favorite 80s comics. And they haven't... Dan Spiegel has not done a lot since, which is a shame, because he's in his early late 80s, early 90s. I don't know his exact age. And his art still looks as good as it did in the 60s. Watch out for that uh, thirty-five cent variant. That'll set you back about one hundred eighty bucks if you can find it. <laughs> now, yeah, I don't like them that much. When DC got a hold of it in '97, their first run went to 2010, and it was just Scooby Doo. That's where our good buddy Terrence Creep did a lot of writing for the earlier issues. One hundred fifty-nine issues, two special editions, two summer specials in 2001, 2002, and they've reprinted them in five different books. Since then, they've started another series called Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? I think they're up to 66 issues by now. And then they're also doing a book that I've enjoyed off and on called Scooby-Doo Team-Up. Which reprints the online strips that they do. Yeah, and that's always fun because they're, they're running into different people, things like that. There's been a number of one-shots. I mean, the Free Comic Book Day, the Halloween Fest. There was one that was part of a, a giveaway with some other item. So, but Scooby-Doo started around. The reason we mentioned that, of course, is Jim Lee looking to bring back Scooby-Doo pretty soon in his in May. own unique style. It will be in the previews that you will have received by the time you hear this episode. And, of course, they're also going to make the big Hanna-Barbera universe, for back of, lack of a better word, which I'm actually kind of intrigued by. Just because, you know, I want to see, uh, you know, Huckleberry Hound, you know, team up with uh, you know, the dog from uh, Johnny Quest. I'm vaguely interested in that simply because it means we're going to get a Johnny Quest comic. And, de Deputy dog. And, at, and yes, Jen, I know your favorite TV series in the world is a parody of Johnny Quest, but I still love Johnny Quest itself. It's kind of become its own uh, own own thing in mythology. I think it started out as a parody, but it's it's not anymore. Yeah. And you're only mentioning that because I was falling asleep. No, I'm mentioning that to bring you in. Because you are part of the show. I love the Venture Brothers. Oh, good stuff. I started rewatching it. I know there was a new season, and I still haven't watched any of the new episodes. Because I haven't done my... Since since the season comes out every like three or four years, <laughs> every time the show starts, every time a new season comes out, I rewatch the whole show. So I just finally in the last uh, last week started my, you know, uh, yeah. my next rewatch of the entire show. Yep. So I I started watching it on season one. So I gotta watch all that before I catch up to where where it's at now. Now, of course, That's kind of how I come with Rick and Morty. I do have to let Corey know he he was right. There was a 1977 Scooby Doo Marvel comic. Yes. Yep. Yeah, but it was Hanna Barbera's fill in the blank Dynamite. 
was number one. And then in the p- panel, you could see Scooby-Doo, Yogi Bear, McGilla Gorilla, all those guys. And, of course, there was a Laugh Olympics at that same time, too, that had all the Hanna-Barbera characters, but n- not an actual Scooby-Doo comic. So that's the clincher. And why do you bring this up, Joe? Because I sold all the Scooby-Doo I had. I don't know if this is ah. because of Jim Lee's impending revisit to Scooby-Doo, or just I happen to hit the right Scooby-Doo fan. And if you oh, are looking for Scooby-Doo, don't, because I don't have any. But if you are looking for Transformers, Dark Towers, Green Hornet, I've just put up big runs of those, all the newer stuff, some of the variants and things like that. Go to Crazy. Send me a quick message, either through eBay or through the G- Gmail or whatever. And like I said, I'll give you a bonus. Something out of my vast accumulation of crap. Except this, not my three musketeer box. I'm keeping it. Well, it's time for Freaking and Geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? I messed up my back at work. You talked about that yeah. last week. Is it any better? Well, I, it, it actually, it, it kind of got me down because after the podcast, I went into the the doctor the next day, and they referred me to my chiropractor. He took an X-ray, and he said the L5, L4 lower back discs, which have some fancy ass word for swollen, could be not quite a bulge. It's not bulging out, but it is showing signs of swelling. So uh, chiropractor put me on a three-day no-work restriction, and I had this thing I was supposed to do where I lay on my back, lift one leg at a time, and it's just supposed to get the pressure off so that ibuprofen and ice can get the swelling down. And be damned if my leg was so damn tense, I couldn't even get my leg to lay flat on the floor. So he said, I, you know, heat that down a little bit, loosen the muscles, I tell you, I need to get a hundred bucks up and get some of that DDP yoga going. Since then, I'm on a two-hour restriction at work. I can't do any one thing more than two hours, be it standing, sitting, uh, doing that weird pose the Karate Kid did. I got a <laughs> ten-pound weight restriction, which means I'm kind of useless. On the plus side, though, by the time I get back to work, maybe we have a new inline system going where I won't be lifting bags into a machine, lifting them, throwing them on the belt. The bags, if we have to search and come in on a neat conveyor belt, move it onto a table that slides over to another conveyor belt, you know, danger of twisting wrong, but there's no lifting involved. Unfortunately, it was one week away from when my back got hurt. On a plus side, in two weeks, I'm eligible to get weekly massages until I get better. So I got that going for me, which is nice. Uh, and in the immortal words of the, the modern philosopher, Mick Jagger, what a drag it is getting old. Jen, what are you freaking on? What's your, got you down and upset? Ice. <laughs> I've, I've had some adventures with ice in the last week. I, uh, and not just in your drinks? Not just in my drinks, unfortunately. Uh, I was coming home the other night, and uh, I had bought some uh, supplies for painting, and there was uh, quite a lot of bags in the cab of my truck, which, you know, I don't have a trunk or a back seat. So parked on the street, as I've mentioned before, uh, I was standing on the highly impacted and melted together into ice snow and it was piled up on a pretty good incline and I slipped Mm. and um, the door was open and my leg uh, my right calf kind of shin I guess like slammed into the bottom of the truck you know like where the door closes uh and then I caught my balance and got up and slipped again. And I did that three or four times. I slammed my, cause I, every time I would get up, I would slip again and, and hit the door again. Mm. Um, so I hit my leg in like the same place, uh, you know, three or four times fairly hard. So that's actually, it's bad enough that it, it hurt. It's hurt 
for the last few days, but it's one of those ones that's like so deep, it's actually taking days for the bruise to form. So, so there's that. Uh, and then a couple of nights later, I was picking up a friend who doesn't have a car, and we were driving to get some food, and I hit a patch of black ice. And, and I wasn't expecting it because in the last couple of days, it's kind of warmed up. Uh, this was two or three nights ago. It's, it's kind of warmed up. So a lot of the snow and the ice has been melting down. Um, and there was this one like wet patch where apparently in this stretch of road, there's always a little bit of standing water all the time. And, and it had just gotten cold enough to refreeze, uh, this water. So I, and I didn't see it and drove over it and as soon as I went over it I guess I was going about 35 miles an hour uh the truck just started sliding into the other lane of oncoming traffic uh and then actually spun around so Ooh. the truck so it it was terrifying for the couple of seconds while it was happening uh the truck actually completely did a 180 turn and and rotated until it was facing the correct direction to drive in the other lane when it finally stopped. Uh, and amazingly, I didn't hit anything. Amazingly, the truck wasn't damaged. I had lost enough velocity that by the time I bumped into a curb, the truck stopped on its own. Uh, and once it had stopped, it was awesome. <laughs> but it was absolutely terrifying while it was happening. And fortunately... Fortunately, it was fairly late at night. It was around uh, midnight, and yes, we were going to Taco Bell. Uh, so there weren't any cars coming or going in either direction for the entire, you know, fraction of seconds or seconds this was happening. Uh, but I almost, you know, I mean, there was a mailbox there. I don't know how I didn't hit the mailbox, but but, but yeah, I actually completely spun my truck around on the road after driving over some black ice so that was that was an experience uh we we turned and went a different way to get where we were going i said i'm not driving over that again uh, i'm not testing my luck you know i've i've been kind of uh without getting into too much specifics you know i've been kind of just following life where it leads me lately especially in the last month and um, taking opportunities that show up and being grateful for good luck that's thrown my way. So fortunately, I survived that. The truck remains unscathed. Nothing was damaged. No one else's vehicle, no bushes, trees, garbage cans, or mailboxes. Uh, so we went the other way. Uh, I got my Taco Bell. It was delicious. And I went home and uh, started rewatching the Venture Brothers. <laughs> well, we're glad you're I'm safe. freaking on fucking ice. Corey, what are you freaking on this week? Uh, my freakings are both comic-related. DC has announced details for Rebirth. They've talked about the books that will be coming out. They've talked about the format they will be using. They've talked about the price point they will be using. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Even... Let, let, let me guess, let me guess, let me guess. No creator information. Absolutely. Oh, I get a cigar for that one. No oh. creator information at all. They've announced all these books, and oh, we'll tell you the creative teams later. It's like they've learned nothing. They did this with the New 52. In the New 52, they pumped millions of dollars into marketing, and when they came out, it was like, oh, wow, they sell really well, and then they started plummeting because people went, well, I don't know these creators, and I don't follow these creators, and they would move creators off books quickly, in the middle of stories, sometimes in the middle of issues. And and I know that I, I don't want to be the guy who constantly bashes DC, but DC, we buy books for creators. I could not care less about The Secret Six. Could not give less of a shit about The T Secret Six. Now, if Gail Simone is writing it, I want to buy The Secret oh, Six. But I was drawing it. If Frank Cho's drawing it, I'll buy anything. But if Gail Simone is drawing Elongated Man, I'll buy it. I can't Gail say Simone is... I did buy anything, because I did buy that one issue of Zombie Cow. <laughs> Same here. Oh. Frank, you owe me for that. 
But it's the creators that sell book, not not the characters. I didn't give a shit about Batgirl until Cameron Stewart came on and started writing it, and the art changed to a different style. Before that, I could not care less. Um, Tony Daniels doing Batman, I didn't care until they got a good writer on with him. DC, it, it, it's not the 90s anymore. We don't care that you're going to be doing seven Batman books. We want to know who's writing it and who's drawing it. That's how we determine our dollars. Why do you think Image is continues to grow? Because it's not, oh, here is character A. It's these two creators are putting out this book. It's a different world, and they need to catch up. Joe's posting on Facebook while you're talking again. Yeah, I know. I'm used to that. The second thing that... Joe, do you know what burns my ass? Uh, flame at about approximately butt height. Right. But also when people who work in the comics industry get comic book history wrong. Now, Eric Stevenson, who's the big high muckety-muck at Image, gave a speech at Comic Pro where he talked about creators are what sell books. But the first part of the speech continued the bullshit that we have been told for 50 years. Because he said, back in the 50s, it was the comics code that killed, nearly killed comic books. This is a myth. This is not true. This has been debunked. The Comics Code was much like the Motion Picture Code. They put it in place so that Congress wouldn't come in and put laws in place. In many ways, the Code saved comics. What killed comics is was that American News, the biggest magazine distributor in the United States, went bankrupt with no notice. Now, the Code killed a lot of little bitty, fly-by-night crap publishers because they didn't want to pay the code, and it's, ah, you know, we're not even going to bother putting our books through the code. We'll just move into magazines. We'll move into paperback books. We'll move into this, something that's not so much trouble and isn't getting looked at. When American News went under, it killed all pulp magazines. The few pulp magazines that were left killed them, because there were warehouses full of magazines that couldn't get to stores. You know what American News going under almost killed, Joe? Hmm. Playboy. I knew, Hugh they, Hefner, I knew they were communists. Hugh Hefner was publishing four magazines. American News went under. They're all gone except Playboy because Playboy had a huge subscription base. For almost a year, Playboy couldn't get to newsstands. He couldn't get the magazine into stores to sell. So he had built up a subscriber base because of the literary content which is why Hefner always pushed subscriptions. He no longer trusted magazine distribution. That is what killed comics. Atlas, which was timely, which became Marvel, he had built his own distribution that went through American News. American News went under. Martin Goodman has to put together a deal with National Periodical, which became DC, where eight books a month, that's all you get. You get eight comics a month, and he took the deal so he could get his magazines and his paperback books out there. It's not the code. The code did not kill comics. Please stop saying it. It drives me up a tree. Joe, what are you geeking on? Uh, I, uh, you know, not really a lot, to tell you the truth. I did kind of uh -huh. dig that there were two articles on comic shops that we both love and adore. The first one was our good buddy... It's up in St. Cloud, Granite City Comics. This is from the St. Cloud Times. And I think I posted it. I don't know if I posted it on our Facebook page or not, but it's kind of cool uh, to see some good publicity from a store. It's been around for 30 years. It's kind of crazy. And there was a good picture of uh, Tim <laughs> Moore up there. So, what I did. I, I, I have to say, I, I have no idea what Jim is I, 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 City I, Comics is not that funny. I do to tell you the truth. Joe's so. posted the selfies. Oh, God. <laughs> so, anyway, the picture with Tim, I'm going to be taking it's him talking to uh, one of his customers, and of course, I'm going to make it. <laughs> the first one is, of course, he's like, Ah, oh, but uh, this Amazing Fantasy 15 is only worth 10 bucks. I'll give you five. So, and of course, Tim's more than thrilled over that. 
The second one was out of uh, Twin Cities Geek, and it says, From the Stands, Dreamhaven Books is still standing. And apparently From the Stands is a series that profiles comic stores around the Twin Cities. This week they did one on uh, Dreamhaven, which is kind of cool. And, of course, we talked about it earlier. Not only is Greg Ketter a damn fine, handsome man, but the fact that his long-term business partner has come back, and he's now open seven days a week. So it talks a little bit. Uh, Greg gives into an interview. I did not realize it was a time where business was so bad he almost went under. Uh, Joe, we went to the closing party, remember? No, that was just he was moving to his uh, other store, I thought. Nope. Nope. This was um, while we were doing the podcast because it, um, Brian Wilson was there and Mike Edmondson was there and he had a Irish band in who played Wake uh, songs. Yes, I remember that. I've been to a few Irish Wakes sponsored by Green and, Haven. And this was, you know, Greg saying, all right. I'm closing up. I'm just going to do mail order. I will open for individual customers, blah, 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 but regular hours are over. And then a few months later, it's, well, I guess uh, reports of my demise were highly exaggerated, (laughs) which was good because Dreamhaven's one of the great independent bookstores in the nation. you got to love it because, you know, longtime friend and store supporter Neil Gaiman loves his vintage smut. Harlan Ellison himself has described Dreamhaven as a book seeker's cave of miracles. And of course, he's won the Will Eisner Spirit of Retailer Awards, and you just, you don't get that by just being a comic store. So you, if you ever get a chance, definitely stop by either one of these two stores. They're just a lot of fun, and it's good to see some positive publicity in the, in the comics. That's pretty much it. Uh, Chin, what are you, uh, geeking on? I think I tried to mention this last week but I was too wasted by the end of the episode. Um, But I recently started doing stuff with my YouTube channel. So you check it out. It's uh, YouTube slash Gin Wicked, so that's pretty easy. But uh, I started making videos. So, yeah, I have uh, overcome my camera anxiety like I had to overcome my microphone anxiety. So, yep. I am uh, talking and dancing and singing and doing all kinds of crazy shit on the YouTube. Check it out. And it's adorable. I am fucking adorable. (laughs) I'm not just going to mince words about it here. You know, I mean... Truth truth is truth, and we're big on that. I mean, it, it doesn't even matter. It's like I exist outside of time. Age doesn't even affect me. She's a time old, lord, Joe. A She's time a time lord. lord. Whatever that nerdy hat. thing means. No, I, you know, I I made this video. I was upset um, about Valentine's Day and being alone. And I thought, you know, rather than just, yeah, everybody, like half of my Facebook feed is like flowers and candy. Like, oh, you know, my boyfriend or whatever. And. The other half of it's like, you know, posting, I'm alone and I hate my life and fuck all, fuck all y'all, you know? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't really want, I don't really identify with either of those things because I've never really, I've never really been into Valentine's Day to begin with, but, but I mean, I kind of get it, you know, like it sucks to like see all that when you're by yourself. And I I thought, I don't want to be the one that just, you know, let me just, wallow in in being miserable or whatever so I said you know I don't think anyone in the world except maybe a couple people have ever seen me dance so I am gonna play it's a Pharrell Williams happy and I'm gonna I'm gonna dance like how you know most everybody does when nobody else is around only I'm going to video it and upload it to the entire internet Uh, so that's what I did and I got messages all day long from people like you know, thank you, today usually sucks, and seeing this made my fucking day, you know, so if me being a stupid asshole on YouTube makes you smile, you know what, mission accomplished, so please check it out and subscribe to my channel, and I love it if you leave comments, and my new actual video series is a question and answer thing, and they could be serious questions about me, they could be serious questions about my work, or it can be some off-the-wall shit that I can write jokes about, 
or just stare in the camera like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Uh, so you can send me your questions and subscribe to the channel, and if you get lucky, I might answer it. And Corey can vouch. They're pretty funny. Yep. I approve. I give it a thumbs up. Usually whenever it's posted, I give it a thumbs up. Because she messages me like seven seconds after it's done. Did you like it? Did you like it? Uh, it it's still loading. You know what? You know what? I can find other advanced screeners. <laughs> if you got a problem with this. I don't have a problem. It's just the eagerness of it. It's like, tell me, tell me now, tell me now. I made a thing. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me for being so happy and excited <laughs> and enthusiastic. Jeez, bro, way to bring a geeking down. We're <laughs> all excited for her yeah. channel. You got her up and My going. My single mission positive. in life is to make faces on YouTube for other people's enjoyment. I mean, I personally want to be <laughs> good enough Your friends with you that I trust you to preview <laughs> this stuff before I show it to the general public. You know what? I'm sure there are plenty of other people out there who would be happy to advance screen my videos and give me some feedback. And have I not given you feedback on every single one? You word? like everything, so I mean it's... No, I don't. I don't like everything. Uh-huh. We'll, we'll talk off the air off the things where I said, you know, th this doesn't work. Anymore. No, fuck that. I'm going to sleep after we're done with this. <laughs> I'm tired as hell. That's why I'm not drinking, because you just hear me snoring on the desk again, and I got in trouble for that last time. Don't think, Mr. Whoever You Are out there, don't think I don't know. I know. I find out everything. Corey, what are you freaking on? Look, I wanted a dramatic pause there, okay? Thanks, Joe. You know I'm I'm big on spoiler alerts. It, it's we're, we're doing geeking. Besides, he'll, he'll edit the pause out. Whatever anyway. you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, I I got caught up on all new X Men, which is one of the few X Men books that I really like. It's the story of the X Men who are kind of pulled out of time from whenever, because. Well, the, the original stories were in the early 60s, but now with uh, Marvel's time shifting and, and everything, it was, I don't know, 2008, 2009. Marvel's time shifting makes me feel very, very old. But I really enjoy it because they are doing character stuff, which is what I read the X-Men for. I don't read the X-Men for the, the over-the-top melodrama. I don't read it for the mysterious villain from the alternate whatever. I read it for the character stuff, the character interaction, and this book is very much built on the character interaction with the the X-Men from the past and the modern world. It It's such a rich vein of storytelling that they used to do with Captain America, but they don't anymore. I enjoyed the fact that forever Captain America was the World War II soldier who's in the modern world. And it's, modern writers don't even touch on that anymore, which is a wasted opportunity. But the all-new X-Men is one of Marvel's books that I really, really enjoy. And Joe Harris, who wrote X-Files, has a new comic that has come out called Snowfall. And as much as I enjoy his X-Files, this is a really good book. It's a little horror, a little mystery. The first issue really sucks you in. Um... I, I'm looking forward to seeing where he's going with it. I didn't have a lot of time to read a lot of other comics, but I have started reading some some fluff books because I like to alternate. I'll read something that's kind of makes my mind work, and then right after that I'll read something that I don't even need to put my mind into first gear. And I'm in between books that have a lot more substance. I'm reading the Doc Savage novels, and I read like the third Doc Savage novel in the series. And yes, he does the same phrases for each character. Yes, the plots are hackneyed and silly and formulaic. But gosh darn it, if I didn't spend an hour and a half reading this book and have a lot of fun while doing it. 
And I think that's one of the things that's missing in a lot of modern fiction because we don't have as much of the, ah, just pick up a book to read for a couple hours. We don't have those books that are just, ah, this is just fun. It's light reading. It's, it's nice and fluffy and fun. So I am enjoying that. There is also a new Destroyer novel that is supposed to come out. The Destroyer was a series that some people may know from the movie from the 80s, Remo Williams. But it was a men's adventure series like The Executioner and The Death Merchant and, and all that, except it was humor-based. And that's why it's lasted this long. When the publisher that was doing it went under, the book series kind of went away. But it has come back. It's available on Amazon as ebooks now, and the newest one is supposed to be coming in about a week. And I am looking forward to it. And very excited to see it. And that's what I'm geeking on. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for about an hour and a half. Almost. Almost. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most, Joe. Hang on a second, of course, at the opportune time, my computer freezes up. He's yeah, too whatever. Busy taking you're taking selfies and making image macros. Yeah, you're 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 taking more selfies because you're a twelve year old girl. Let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am persecuted whenever I am contradicted. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Jim? Hit my music, boys.